Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul Tutorials in Kerbal Space Program 1.12. In this video I'm going to talk about how to figure out how much wing you need for your space planes in Realism Overhaul thanks to the use of FAR, Fermi Aerospace Research, which is a nifty tool for figuring out how to make your planes. Now this install is still the install that I made in the Installing RO video and that was a very bare bones install. We didn't have any extra mods. In fact, uh, if you take a look at the part list here, most of the parts are the stock parts just modified by Realism Overhaul. You can see they should be all the familiar parts that you know from stock except for a few things like the procedural tanks and the procedural wings which we'll be making use of in here. And so we have the Mark II parts which are just really good for making space planes here in Realism Overhaul as well. In fact we have a nifty little plane here in this case we are getting 3,000 meters per second or so, six, meter, uh, six minutes, so we probably need a boost stage. Uh, we need something or another to lift us up, but this could be a space plane. It has really big wings though. Maybe we don't need such big wings. The engines incidentally are the engines from Beren. Uh, they are the RD-58 variant, the last one 17D12, which is one that has 15 ignitions, uses a synthetic kerosene and oxygen and gets 362 seconds of ISP and 86 uh, kilonewtons of thrust. Not throttleable, but we do have the multiple ignitions, so that's handy. And the reason that they're good is because the kerosene is fairly dense, and so we have a tank here and tank here right now. And I said 3,000, but we haven't filled up the tanks. Uh, if we fill up the tanks to the max here, uh, we see a 4,575. So that's really good, but that's pushing the burn time of the engine. That's past the burn time of the engines, almost certainly. So, um, well, I don't know. That variant of the RD-58 might have a pretty long burn time. So uh, we could underfuel these. The point of having this tank and this tank is, of course, to maintain balance. So as they deplete, the center of mass isn't going to change too much. But when we're trying to figure out how much wing we have or need, uh, we're, this is going to be a space shuttle configuration. If you're not going to be a space shuttle configuration and you need to take off from runway, uh, you'll need to make sure to have it fully fueled. But when we're coming back, we're probably going to have a minimal amount of propellant, maybe some RCS propellant. And so it'll be more like this and lighter. And that is what we need to plan for in terms of our wing size. Now, at, you might want to plan for getting extra drag using the wing. Uh, usually the space shuttles have a high angle of attack and they use the wing to get drag in order to slow down. And in that case you might want extra wing compared to what FAR might tell us is the minimal. Uh, but let's take a look at FAR and try to explain uh, what's going on with that. But you can see as we go from full fuel here to empty so this is uh, full fuel. It's really close. Maybe I should move the wing a little bit further back. But at this point, full of fuel, I'm intending that there, it's going to have a booster. It's practically going to be in space by that point, And it's just accelerating to get into orbit. So I don't really care about the balance too much. And we're mostly caring about it here. And so once the fuel depletes, it should be okay and still fairly reasonable. If we want to check out the balance here, we use, uh, there are various functions in Ferrum Aerospace. There's a static analysis, uh, the data and stability derivatives, and I, the interpretation of the static analysis I'll leave for now. I think the data and st stability derivatives, especially with their clear coloration, will give us the best read on things. And we're going to start out at zero kilometers in zero Mach number. Well, not zero Mach number. Let's say a reasonable takeoff speed. Um, and here, well, I say reasonable. That's pretty fast. But, or landing speed, I should say. And we see that it's all green. But let's do something drastic to it to see what the effect would be. Let's take off these. These are all moving control surfaces. There are three types of wings in B9 procedural wings. There are the control surfaces, the wings, which are fixed, and the all moving wings, which are like canards, or these are actually acting the same way. And I'm going to take these off. And now let's calculate this. And we see we have an uh, issue here. This is red and that says yaw right angular acceleration which is what you would expect. Yaw is controlled by the vertical stabilizers. We just took off the vertical stabilizers and now yaw is bad. So once we put them back on we see that they're good. But is there too much? Is there too much vertical stabilizer here? We press J to resize these wing pieces and let's say I make it really small 
Let's say like that. That looks unreasonably small, right? When I calculate, yeah, it goes back to being negative. Okay, and so we want it a little bit bigger, but maybe we had it too big there. Maybe it could be like that. And you can see it's closer to being zero, but it's not quite zero. Now it's okay, but is it good for different flight regimes? Like right now we're talking about right at the surface when we're about to land. Let's say we are at Mach 2. We're probably not going to be Mach 2 at zero kilometers, and it in fact would have a little bit of a problem with that. So, but in any case, we're not planning on doing that. So, uh, 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers is fine. 20 kilometers, 20 kilometers is fine. Um, if we say 30 kilometers, that too is actually okay. But probably we'll be stalling a little bit. Well, you can see this is the angle of attack that we need in order to continue creating lift. This is the speed that it thinks Mach 2 is at this height. So Mach 2, according to it, is 605 meters per second at that height. But then we would need to have an angle of attack that is the angle above the prograde vector uh, of 15.8 degrees, let's say, in order to keep going up. Now, in re-entry with a space plane, we don't necessarily need to keep going up. So that's not critical. As long as we're, just, we're stable, we're okay. But we are uh, threatening a stall, potentially, if uh, we actually try to fly this at that height and this speed. Uh, at Mach 3, it's much nicer, only 12. And then Mach 4... So this is a very nice plane as far as stability is concerned. As it gets really high up, the air gets really thin, and the predictability of the of the numbers might be a little bit of an issue. Here we don't have just barely don't have enough vertical stabilizer, but maybe if we go Mach five at that speed at that height, mm, well, no, going faster is not so good. So the faster you go, the more vertical stabilizer you need. So we can sort of create a flight profile here of how fast or slow we should be going at different heights. It seems like this is a bit problematic as both that and that get an issue at the same time. Well, three, we probably need to be under three, Mach three. Unless we want to increase the size of the vertical stabilizers. So uh, other things that you can check out here except for this one with the vertical stabilizer is of course if we have the center of lift in front of the center of mass. Let's say we move the wing up like that. And what you'll expect is uh, to have this one in particular messed up. And that'll indicate, oh, we need to make sure that the center of mass is, uh, center of lift is behind the center of mass. And then once you do that, uh, this is getting closer to zero. And then this is happy. Uh, this is a problem because actually we would like the vertical stabilizers to be further back. That's one reason why you know you might want to mount it on top there, especially on a plane like this with the wing close to the center of mass. We want the vertical stabilizers further back and they'll have more efficiency like that. So we can actually make them smaller if they're further back or we could just put them on the body, make them fixed instead of all moving would be probably good. Uh, having them be all moving was an expedience in this case as I was slapping this together, but really it would be nicer not to have them all moving just for control purposes. It's a little bit finicky. So let's let's just do something unreasonable and move them really far back. Oh, but then this is a problem. But can I make this work? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> but the center of lift is actually a little bit tenuous there. Okay, there we go. Actually, the Spaceship 2 from uh, Virgin Galactic, I think it is, you know, uh, that they run out of Mojave, is almost has vertical stabilizers like this, right at the tip of the wings. But anyway, that is a possibility. And if we go back to ground level and, let's say, our takeoff speed, uh, we have a little bit of an issue with the center mass and center lift again, so let's move that. Okay, uh, so you can check things like that. Now what else we want to pay attention to is the speed here and the angle of attack. So right now we don't have our landing gear. Let's put the landing gear on, that might be important. The landing gear tends to be pretty heavy. Normally I'd use adjustable landing gear because it scales a little bit better, 
but uh, we'll have the regular landing gear and I, uh, I think we'll have the four-wheel one in the back. So we need the landing gear behind the center of mass. Doesn't have to be behind the center of lift, but definitely has to be behind the center of mass. And what we're really interested in is actually the angle that will allow us to land with minimal downward excel uh, downward velocity and not hit the engines or potentially a body flap here. So there's an angle here that is safe to rotate at. We can keep the pitch up at that angle. And we need to make sure that at that angle, we get lift, net lift, which means we would be going up. So, and that's true of landing as well. We want to make sure that in a pinch, uh, we can rotate at that angle and still be going up. This angle of attack needs to be less than that tail strike angle and at the speed that we want to land at. So if you want to land at uh, Mach 2, uh, 0.25, well, that'd be less than the space shuttle's landing speed. Let's say uh, 0.28. That's about the space shuttle's landing speed. And so 10 degrees. That means that in order to keep yourself level, be going down minimally or zero, uh, you would need to pitch up by 10.58 degrees. And so you can figure it out. If you've got longer landing gear, you can get more or less wing in order to make sure that your plane will not have a tail strike on landing or on takeoff if you're configuring it to take off by itself. So if we see this here and go, okay, well, no, I think I can pitch up to 15 degrees even. Uh, well, let's reduce the wing. I will keep the, uh, just for the sake of not messing things up too much, we'll keep the control surfaces. And we see if we reduce the wing as expected, the angle of attack necessary to stay level is increased. And if you increase the length of the wing, of course, uh, the angle of attack necessary to stay level at this same speed is decreased. Now, if you think you can get away with a uh, higher landing or takeoff speed, again, depending on whether you're configuring, configuring this for landing or takeoff, then of course, you can just do that and then a lower angle of attack necessary as you go faster and faster in order to take off. Skylon takes an absurd amount of velocity to take off. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, the faster you can go, the less you have to tilt up in order to take off or the heavier you can make this and still take off. So let's say we were trying to take off with the full propellant load. Okay. Uh, half propellant load, we could do it with 4.66 angle of attack at 150 meters per second, but now we need 7, which is not not doable. I mean, it's possible to be going 150 meters per second on the even the stock runway and uh, tilt by 7 degrees. I think we've got 7 degrees there, so we'll have to be careful. Uh, maybe a longer landing legs would be better or just pulling them down a bit. So. In a pinch, you could just sort of pull them down a bit, and then suddenly you've got extra angle to work with. But that's how you figure out how much wing you need. So if you can get away with uh, even less, how, how little can we get? Is there a point where we would be not happy? Well, interestingly, it doesn't seem that way. So, shall we try that out? <laughs> this, this seems ridiculous, right? Right? But, uh, well, maybe we should check this. Yeah, I feel like checking this. Now, actually, the engines, the RD-58s, I don't think get much thrust at sea level. Um, so that might be a problem. 0.14. So we're probably not getting anywhere, actually. This stock, this uh, barrel bones install doesn't even have atmospheric autopilot. I'm not feeling the acceleration here. We probably want more surface-oriented rocket engines. But it said 150 meters per second. <laughs> we'll see what we get to at the end of the runway. Uh, barely half of the speed that we need. So, as expected, we, uh, we can't get off the ground rotating like that. So what if we put SRBs on? <laughs> what if we put some boosters? 
can we get to uh we could put bigger engines hey let's well it'll throw the balance off to put really big engines so instead of trying to put the big engines we'll put srbs right at the center of mass slung underneath caster ones i don't know if they'll torch the thing we're now heavier though For some reason it decided to shrink all my windows that I had carefully made, configured last time. Okay. Oh, they've, they've got, they're pushing our nose up a little bit too. Hold on there. They're not going fast enough. Okay, now we're going fast enough. Oh! But... But, uh, we're a little bit in balance without the other engines. Uh, we were sort of going up, though. Again, I, I would probably want to underfuel this in order to actually take off with it safely. This is just, uh, for instructive purposes, I guess. Let's get a nice side view to make sure we don't scrape this time. That atmospheric autopilot will help keep the nose stable much better than SAS so that uh, when we pull up it's less likely that we'll scrape the tail. Uh, oh, in this case the SRVs are pushing us quite a lot. I guess we'll just keep it like that since it's sort of... It'll definitely show us when we start going up, huh? Oh, we can go up. So about 150. We've got extra mass, so it's a little bit higher than 150. But you get the picture. Even this ridiculous weight can work out for you. If you take a look at the numbers that FAR gives you, and it'll tell you what angle you need to be at in order to take off at what speed. That's as simple as that. But uh, that doesn't mean this whole thing is really stable at turning <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, this is not, uh, not, not a great plane at the moment. So, the quantity of the ship mass divided by the wing area is called the wing loading. And so you can get the wing loading. You have the ship mass there and to the vessel mass and then we can get the wing area like that uh, i think that's probably right hopefully uh, sometimes i'm suspicious of that number but yeah that is called the wing loading it's also related to another quantity called the ballistic coefficient which is the amount of mass on the heat shield area or the area hitting the atmosphere on re-entry so that's called the ballistic coefficient in the case of the ballistic coefficient on re-entry uh, the mass divided by the surface area is telling you how much drag deceleration you're going to get. In this case, it's telling you about how much lift you're going to get, and lift and drag are sort of related. But the high, the lower the wing loading, the lower the velocity you need in order to maintain level flight. So you want less mass on the same wing area, and you can compare different planes based on their wing loading. Just take their mass divided by the wing area and you can see, sort of make a guess as to the velocity that they need in order to maintain a little flight. Though, of course, the actual shape of the body also has an effect on that. But I think that's all I'm going to say about that aspect of FAR. There's one other aspect of FAR that I'll talk about, and that's the transonic design. And that's if you need your plane to get past the speed of sound. Uh, this is a very particular thing. If it's accelerating itself past the speed of sound, then you use this cross-sectional area curve, and you want that to be as smooth as possible. Um, there's the cross-sections of the plane, and so one way to make it smoother, for instance, might be to increase the wing root here. You'll note that that's starting to smooth line out, and we'd pull the uh, control surfaces back, and, um, you know, maybe... Something like that, but of course that has other effects. And 
you know, you'll see occasionally planes having little bulbuses, bulbous things jutting out in order to smooth this line, and some of the design is driven by that. So that reduces the amount of uh, drag induced while going transonic. And I'll, that's all I'm going to explain about that. So you can look at that and try and optimize that so that your planes can accelerate through the speed of sound smoothly. But of course, for a space shuttle that's coming back down, you don't need to do that. Yeah, you, you actually want it to get more drag and slow down faster, uh, generally speaking. Whether you need to worry about this too much is uh, up to you. I mean, it depends on what other uses you put your space plane to. So anyway, yeah, I mean, this is obviously not the best design in the world that I used to demonstrate, but it was to give you some ideas. Actually, we should have optimized that without the SRBs there. But anyway, so that's all I want to say about how much wing you need. You can use FAR to figure it out long before you uh, get to the runway, and you'll know exactly how much you need to tilt up at what speed in order to take off. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.